Among the newsmen traveling with Mr. Kennedy was NBC's Robert McNeil. The motorcade could not have started off in a gayer mood. The president had been in extremely good form all during the Texas tour up to that point, and his good humor was reflected in the press corps as they went with him. It was also reflected in Mrs. Kennedy, who had emerged with quite a new image during this tour. She also had, uh, she of course had quite a name for being shy and retiring in politics. Her few appearances during the uh, 1960 presidential campaign had not been repeated. And this was her first real emergence as a professional-seeming politician's wife. And she really seemed to enjoy the role. Uh, in Houston, in the hotel in Houston on Thursday evening, she delivered a short speech in Spanish to a crowd of uh, Latin American Texans. And uh, her delight in her opportunity to do this was very evident. Later, when she and the president went down in the elevator, I got into the elevator with the uh, Secret Service men, which was next to them, and was right behind Mrs. Kennedy when she walked out through a very crowded lobby. Uh, previously, she would have walked through very serenely, but having very little contact except with her eyes and her smile with the crowd around her, but uh, on this occasion, she went over to the rope barrier uh, behind which the very enthusiastic crowd was waiting, and uh, she shook hands, w moved over and shook hands with them very deliberately. Um, the, after Houston, the president uh, moved on to Fort Worth, and again, he was in extremely good form. The morning of Friday, November 22nd, was rainy. Uh, it had been arranged that the president would go to a Chamber of Commerce breakfast, but such a loud, large crowd gathered outside his hotel before the appointed time for the breakfast, that, uh, and there was such a clamor that he arranged to go across the street. And he went out in the rain. He looked, he had a sheen of... of fitness and good humor about him. His eyes were sparkling. He looked very rested. As he came out into the rain, his hair, which is normally somewhat unruly, still looked slightly damp from having just newly combed it down. He bounced up onto the platform. He was cheered by the huge crowd which was waiting there in the rain. And he made a joke which, which delighted them. He said, Mrs. Kennedy is not here because she is still arranging things. It takes her longer than it does us. That's because it's better looking. She's better looking than we are. The crowd just went into delirium with this. He bounced down off the platform. He went over and he shook every hand within reach all the way around the perimeter of the barriers. And the Secret Service men had an extremely difficult time keeping the hordes of people back from him. He went back to the hotel, he stopped. This was described as a non-political tour, but um, President Kennedy, who had politics in his blood, who delighted in his ability to win people on the stump, he stopped on the way back into the hotel, and there were four cowboys there, or cowboy people looking in cowboy dress, on horsemen. They were actually deputy sheriffs of Fort Worth. And he went, he shook hands with each one on his horse, and he went into the hotel, there were more cheers, and he went in to speak at the breakfast. His set speech at the breakfast was a strenuous defense of the TFX fighter plane contract, which has brought um, much of the uh, potential of much prosperity to the city of Fort Worth if the contract uh, is fulfilled as planned. And he received a thunderous ovation when he made this defense of the contract. All the time, the people on the platform had been introduced. There were Vice President Mrs. Johnson, the governor of Texas, John Connolly, and Mrs. Connolly, various congressmen and their wives. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy was conspicuous by her absence. And as all the introductions went by, one by one, everybody began wondering, where is Mrs. Kennedy? Well, it turned out, a few whispers went around, that Mrs. Kennedy was just outside the banquet room, standing like an actress in the wings, waiting with a Secret Service man on either side of her, waiting in a vivid pink suit, a suit that was later to become very famous, in a matching pillbox hat, her eyes sparkling almost with mischief. I went out and watched her standing there, 
And at the appointed moment, the chairman got up and introduced her. She walked a long way. It took her about almost a minute to walk through this cheering crowd and up onto the platform. It was a very calculated entrance. She delighted in it. The president delighted in it. The crowd did. And one had the feeling that the uh, what people had been saying, that Mrs. Kennedy was the president's secret weapon for 1964, that there was some truth in this. There was a White House uh, official standing beside me he did, at the time, he said, he described the entrance as tactical. Uh, the president made another joke about this, and this reinforced the impression that Mrs. Kennedy was going to be a very big part of the campaign in 1964. He said, two years ago when I was in Paris, I said that I was the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy to Paris. I feel like this now on this tour of Texas. And the audience greeted that with a delighted roar. So Friday began on a very gay note, a note of confidence. As they came out of the hotel to move off to the airport, and we waited there, the rain had stopped, a brilliant Texas sun came out, there was a vividly blue sky, there was a crispness in the air, and a crispness about the president and Mrs. Kennedy. I was reminded very much, thinking of the uh, what he had said about Paris, because I covered the Kennedys on that trip in Paris in May 1961, and I was reminded very much of the first day they arrived there when they took the French capital by storm with their youth, their vitality, and the sort of etched lines of their personalities in that bright sunlit atmosphere. And it was like that as they set off for Fort Worth Airport. We got out there just a little bit ahead of them, the press. We got into the press plane, uh, which was a Boeing jet, and settled down for the incredibly short eight-minute jet ride to Dallas, which is just over 30 miles away. Everybody was gay, in uh, good humor. Uh, we were looking at the speech which the president had prepared to deliver in Dallas, which was a stern and very forcefully worded rebuke to people on the extreme right who had been feeding what the president called nonsense to the American people, and he appealed to the American people to stop listening to such nonsense, that words were not the things to go by in the menaces which faced this country. We landed in Dallas, we got out of our plane, and uh, took our places just in front of the huge crowd there, just as the president's jet rolled up. They came out of the jet again with this almost aura of, of vividness about them. They see the colors of their clothes seem much brighter than they had before. This is a sort of after impression. But Mrs. Kennedy came down in that pink suit uh, uh, and as she came to the bottom of the step, she again reached out eagerly to greet people, whereas it wasn't so long before that she was quite shy about it. She was handed a bunch of deep red roses, blood red roses, if that's not the wrong word on this occasion, and held them against this pink suit. And she moved forward, shaking hands very eagerly with all the crowd, who were the official crowd who were there, then broke away from them, again deliberately, and went around shaking the hands of almost everyone within reach. And they went mad with excitement. Most of them were teenagers. And then they got into the open car to begin the drive through downtown Dallas. Now, we had been expecting trouble in Dallas. The police in this city, ever since UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson had been attacked and insulted on October 24th, uh, when a member of an agitator spat on him and another one hit him over the head with a placard, we'd been expecting trouble because the police had. They had put on extraordinary precautions, bringing out one-third of the force, rounding up in addition to what the Secret Service normally did, all possible agitators and warning them, the Dallas authorities were jittery. They did, the name of their city had been besmirched by the Stevenson incident. They didn't want any repetition of this. They were thoroughly ashamed of that. They wanted this, above all, to go very smoothly. It's interesting to note that Ambassador Stevenson has said after his experience here, he first warned the president not to come to Dallas. A few days later, he changed his mind and thought that he'd had too extreme a reaction.
It was one of those days that a reporter finds himself musing about when he's half asleep sometimes in a plane. Your mind drifts as you prepare for the big story. What is likely to happen at this moment and that? Sometimes your mind drifts to the most extreme thing that could happen, and you hastily dismiss it because the most extreme thing never does happen. You pull your mind back to the ordinary things that always do happen. There were no hostile signs at the airport crowd, only eagerness for contact with the Kennedys. Then into the open limousine for the motorcade through Dallas. The president had done this thousands of times. He sat on the right, Mrs. Kennedy on the left. Everywhere the crowds were bigger than expected. The downtown streets. In the first press bus, we strained to catch any signs of the hostility the Dallas precautions had led us to expect. But all we saw was a vast and friendly crowd, but m many thousands of welcome jack signs. It's approaching 12.30 p.m. Dallas time. The crowds in the tall business district are overfilling the sidewalks. Some throw streamers and torn paper in a miniature ticker tape parade. The reporters look at each other. There have been no incidents. At about 12.32, the motorcade turns a corner into a parkway. The crowds are thinner. NBC cameraman Dave Wigman, in a car ahead of us, takes a passing shot of a building. Then three shots are heard, like toy explosions. Wigman jumps from his car, running towards the president with his camera running. People scream and lie down, grabbing their children. I leave the motorcade and run after police who appear to be chasing somebody. The motorcade moves off fast. We don't know it, but the president is mortally wounded in the head and throat. His car races for the hospital. The police find no one and return. Looking for a phone, I go into an office. It's on the ground floor of this building, the Texas School Book Depository. It is not more than four minutes after the shooting. Minutes after a man on the fifth floor of the same building has abandoned a high-powered rifle and fled. Waves of police move in. A small Negro boy tells them he saw a man with a rifle in a window upstairs. Witnesses come up. They saw the president hit. The motorcade reaches Parkland Memorial Hospital. It goes immediately to the emergency entrance. Bleeding profusely and unconscious, the president is lifted onto a stretcher and carried to emergency operating room number one. Doctors say his condition is grave and moribund, that is, near death on arrival. A senior house physician is in attendance. A professor of neurosurgery and other doctors come immediately. Mrs. Kennedy, untouched by the bullets, is with her husband. Texas Governor John Connolly, also seriously wounded, is also in an emergency ward. The doctors try every possible way to save the president. Oxygen is given and anesthetics, a blood transfusion, a tracheotomy, that is making an opening in the throat to aid breathing. The president's heart stops. External massage was applied to his chest, but no pulse results. A priest is called to administer the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church. At approximately one o'clock, the president is dead. The doctors were working too frantically to revive him to notice the exact moment. The press and public do not know the president is dead for another half hour. The only reports available are that he is gravely wounded. At 1.31 Central Time, White House Assistant Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff tells the press the president is dead. At that moment, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, suddenly the new president, leaves the hospital. A new Secret Service detail just arrived, forms up around him, and he leaves for the airport. There, in the president's jet plane, Air Force One, a hastily summoned woman federal judge with a borrowed Bible administers the oath of office. The president's body, in a bronze coffin, is flown to Washington. Dallas Police Chief Just Curry has recently reported that his men have found a partial fingerprint on the rifle believed used in the assassination. The weapon will be sent to Washington to ensure proper handling of the print. The city of Dallas, like the country, is still in a state of shock tonight. Texas Governor John Connolly is in serious but satisfactory condition in hospital. Everyone, public officials, the police, the newspapers, have been too busy to ask the questions about loopholes in security that inevitably will be asked. 
As President Eisenhower said today, this is the kind of thing that freedom compatible with democracy makes possible. The mayor of Dallas, Earl Cabell, in a statement of the city's remorse, has said that all churches in the city will be open tonight. Dallas feels as any American city would if this had happened not here today, but there. This is Robert McNeil, NBC News, reporting.